From out of the playoffs to the top of the Metro, welcome to the Metro Division Playoff Hopeful Season Preview Roundtable. This is the Locked On Podcast Network's 2024 NHL Season Preview. Your team every day. Welcome to the 2024 Locked On NHL Season Preview. In this episode, we'll be breaking down the Metro Division's playoff hopes for teams that didn't quite make the cut last season, including the Columbus Blue Jackets, New Jersey Devils, Philadelphia Flyers, and Pittsburgh Penguins. I'm Rachel Donner, your Friday Locked On NHL host and host of Locked On Flyers here with Jay Foster of Locked On Columbus Blue Jackets, Trey Matthews of Locked On Devils, and Patrick Demp of Locked On Penguins to discuss reasons for optimism for each team heading into the season, how many points each team will get, biggest off-season additions and breakout candidates, and what's at stake for all our teams. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet at FanDuel.com. Uh, the basement of the Metro is alive and well <laughs> from last season here. Uh, let's start with the bottom of the Metro from last season. Obviously, a lot of changes, some planned, some not, unfortunately. Jay, what's the biggest reason for optimism going into this season for the Blue Jackets? Man, that is... Uh... That's a that's a tough question to uh, to start with. Obviously, um, the Blue Jackets are going to look very different this season. They were always going to the the plan was for them to look very different. Obviously, brand new head coach, brand new GM come in, um, cut a lot of the the let's call it the chaff of the team. A lot of the extra bodies that maybe hadn't lived up to expectations. Uh, Patrick Laine asked to move on, um, which you know they did that. Brought in Jordan Harris, who I'm very excited about, um, and then obviously losing. Um, Johnny Cadreau in the way that we did was uh, makes it real tough to look at the season with kind of any real optimism. Um, I will say, looking at the team now, I think the optimism is going to be in kind of the team banding together, playing for Goodrow. You know, that's what he would have wanted. He wouldn't have wanted them to be sad and and you know miserable. And I think they're going to really kind of try and join together as a team and kind of play through that like awful, awful experience. Um, and the youth as well. It's a very young team, lots of very exciting players. Um, we've got a fully healthy Adam Fantilli, which is probably the most exciting part of this season. But um, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It's, it's tough to look at this season and be like, man, I'm really excited for, for this season to start. Trey, the New Jersey Devils were perhaps the most surprising team to not make the playoffs this past season, but it seems like things are headed in the right direction. Why are you optimistic about the Devils this year? The thing about the New Jersey Devils from last season is that I don't think they were as bad as people were projecting them to be. The only thing that was consistent with this Devils team was their inconsistency because here's the thing. They won no more than three in a row. But on the other side of that, they didn't lose no more than three in a row. They were always stuck in neutral. And they were right there till the end. Like, they didn't mathematically get eliminated from playoff contention until early April. If we look at the Metropolitan Division standings, it was a dogfight to see who was going to get eliminated by the Rangers in the first round. If if I'm being completely honest, it was the Devils. It was your team, the Flyers, the Penguins. Capitals, it, it, it was just who was going to get that final wild card spot. And unfortunately, the Devils fizzled out towards the end. They they did have to deal with um, a lot of injuries, and it's kind of hard to find any sort of consistency when a lot of your star players are out for an extended period of time. And Patrick, how about the Pens? Well, the thing about the Penguins this year is that you know that the talent is still there. Sidney Crosby has re-signed. He'll be with the team for two more years after this one, at the very least. He is still one of the best players in the NHL. Evgeny Malkin finally found himself post-trade deadline after the Jake Gensel trade with a new line mate in Michael Bunting, who he has a great amount of chemistry with and seems to bring out the best in him. And then there's the big elephant in the room, the power play. It was genuinely terrible. They bring in David Quinn to be their defense and power play coach. 
and he has gotten the most out of Eric Carlson in his career. He did so in San Jose. And now you hope that that power play finds a form this year. Mix that with a couple young guys and some prove-it deal one-year acquisitions in free agency. This team looks like one that, while they're not going to make their way to the top of the table in the Metropolitan Division, I think they're going to finish a lot higher this year than they did last year. Yeah, I think one of the things for the Flyers is that the expectations, in my opinion, have not changed. And that's a good thing because this is another kind of year that's part of the rebuild with one major change, obviously, in the addition of Matt Bay Mitchkoff, which we're going to talk about more later in this roundtable, I am sure. But other than that, the team is pretty much the same. And the thing that kind of makes me optimistic about it is that the expectations last year were just below the floor and they barely made the playoffs last year. It was a huge, huge accomplishment. So I really see a similar outcome to last year, but I see that as a good thing in the grand scheme because this year is keep the band together, but integrate Matt Bay Mitchkoff into it. And I think as long as they do that, everything will be fine. The point totals here for each of our teams, I think, You know, looking at this, the Devils are currently projected as of recording uh, to have the most points overall, according to FanDuel, at 101.5 for the over-under. Trey, what do you think about this? Is this pressure or is this about right? Uh, How are you feeling about it? I'm feeling somewhat confident that they can get over 100 points. I don't see it out of the realm of possibility, but it really comes down to like just health-wise and can these new guys mesh well together, adding more physicality. And I know I've been talking about this the last few years, but if Jack Hughes can stay healthy, he, he might see his name in the running for the Hart Trophy. So below the Devils are the Rangers and Hurricanes at – uh, 100.5, and those shows are not represented here. But uh, the next team on the list is the New York Islanders, and then we get to the Penguins. So, Patrick, like this really puts you first team out of the playoffs in the points. Like, does that feel right to you? It does. It kind of feels like, as I was saying, where I think they're going to end up is they're going to be in a very similar position as they were the last couple years where they're fighting to get that final playoff spot, basically a wild card in the Eastern conference. I think they're going to probably get somewhere between 90 to 95 points. And you figure that's what it's going to take to get into the postseason in the Eastern conference. But I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but you look at the power play from last year. And if it would have so much has, uh, has been league average, last year that would have given them four to five if not more standings points because in one goal losses their power play was absolutely abysmal so they put in uh if they're able to improve upon that this year you figure that's going to probably beat that over under by a few points like i said i can see them getting somewhere between 91 in 97 points so i would take the over on that and i do think that they're going to be a team that sneaks into the postseason as a wild card and not in the top three of the Metro. Yeah. I think, you know, for the flyers with the 85.5, they had 87 points last year. That's a tough pick to make as a bet, honestly, because it's going to be about the same. This is about the same. I might pick the over just because emotionally they'll probably get a few more wins than they might have uh, otherwise. Uh, But it's interesting because the Blue Jackets were slated last season to finish better than the Flyers and did not. They're in the basement again in the projections here. Like, are they underestimating your team, Jay? It's tough because, and I hate to like color every answer that I'm giving here with, well, obviously losing Johnny Gaudreau is going to affect basically everything about how this team is going to perform this season. 68 and a half feels about right I think I would love for them to perform better. They were set up to perform better. I I have been joking around about how the Blue Jackets are either going to win the Stanley Cup or finish 32nd in the league. And there's just nothing in between that. Absolutely. All right. Well, 
a lot of our teams made some big changes like Jay just alluded to, and we're going to talk about those changes, who the big additions were to our teams and potential breakout candidates coming up next. Some of the best concerts of the year take place in the fall, and it's my favorite time to head to a show. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. My favorite part of the Game Time app is that it's great for getting notified about their super deals so you know you're getting the best bang for your buck. Best of all, they have all-in pricing, so there's no surprise fees at checkout when you activate the feature. Also, the tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through email. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem with the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. All right, so looking at the big moves our teams made this offseason and additions, I am going to pull rank as the leader of this uh, segment we're doing and talk about Matt V. Mitchkoff because I can and I will. And I will be doing that a lot this season. Uh, of course, he was a 2023 draft, a first round pick for my Philadelphia Flyers. And a bunch of teams passed on him because of the fact that he wasn't likely to come over from the KHL for three years. And they just weren't sure, you know, what he would turn out to be and all of that. And then lo and behold, he's suddenly over here now after only one more year in the KHL. And uh, as of recording has played a little bit of rookie camp with the Flyers and got into a prospects game, scored his first goal. And um, I think, you know, the most impressive thing about him is his hockey IQ and his passing. Like you can see his brain working about three steps ahead of everybody else on the ice. And especially when you're there in person, it's harder to tell on TV when they don't show the full ice, but you can see him figuring out everything that's going to happen on the entire ice sheet and watch him like perfectly place a pass at the right time. Now, will the flyer at the other end catch that pass and do something with it? That remains to be seen. But Matt Bay Mitchkov for sure is going to be a game changer for the flyers. But uh, Patrick, you know, what's going on with the pens and is there going to be a breakout star this year? Well, I want to start by saying I am looking very forward to despising Mitch Cobb <laughs> for the next however many years because I can just see it coming. We as the Penguins are due in this rivalry to have someone torture us the way Sidney Crosby has sure. been torturing you guys for 20 years now. But And I can't believe I said 20 well, years. Well, except for <laughs> when Sean Couturier was at his best on the ice. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we'll the, let that go. The big one for me this offseason is similar to yours, a young guy with a lot of promise, and that's Rutger McGroarty. It seemed like he was going to go somewhere other than Winnipeg. He had wanted out. He wanted to turn pro. Winnipeg said, we don't think you're ready. He demanded a trade. And I didn't think that the Penguins were going to be part of that sweepstakes. I didn't think they had enough to really offer to keep themselves in that conversation. Lo and behold, I don't know what kind of voodoo wizardry Kyle Dubas went with to convince Winnipeg to make that trade. But similar to what you were saying, looking at the way he's worked in two prospect uh, camp games in the time we're recording this, he looks like he doesn't belong there. And I mean that in the nicest way possible. He's one of, if not the best players on the ice. We'll see if that translates to an NHL game and my bold prediction that I've, I'm likely to give on Locked On Penguins is I think he's going to have his name in the conversation 
for the Calder. Do I think he's going to win it? Absolutely not. Do I think he's going to even be really nominated in the top three? Probably not. Yeah, it's interesting because I don't even think about the Calder because the Flyers haven't had anybody in that conversation since Shane Goss is there, I believe. And that was even like a side note in the conversation. <laughs> so uh, to have Matt Vay Mitchkoff potentially be in that conversation as well is, is going to be interesting to see. Uh, Trey, I think like it seems like the Devils... Uh, this is more of a team effort this year, but are there any standouts that are going to really drive this uh, club forward that are new? I, I would agree with what you said. It was more of team oriented. So some people that they signed were Stefan Nason. They traded for Paul Cotter. They got Brendan Dillon, Brent Pesci. They reunited with Tomas Tatar. I, I think that's a fair assessment because when you, when I, when you look at some of those players I just listed, None of them were like, I guess, like the go-to names for some teams. And right. even, Jake, even Jacob Markstrom, who finished runner-up in the Vesna Trophy a few years ago to Igor Shesterkin. The, the thing about the Devils was that they already have their star players in Jack Hughes, Nico Heischer, Timo Meyer, Jesper Bratt. It was just more of getting more depth assets because that's what made them so successful during the 2022-2023 season because they had scoring options up and down their lineup. They had more defensive depth. All right, so going into the 2023 offseason, they lost Ryan Graves. They lost Damon Severson to the Blue Jackets. Hope, hope he's doing well. Um, so they they lost some defensive depth. They had to put their trust in Shimo Nemitz and also Luke Hughes. That was a, they, they had a lot of pressure on their shoulders. Um, they lost some physical assets who can work the corners, blue collar type of guys and Miles Wood and, and as we know, Michael McLeod. But you had to find replacements for all those players. And they did that by getting Stephen Nason and also Paul Cotter, guys who are physical. You replace Alexander Holtz's scoring production with Tomas Shatar, who's seen great success paired alongside Nico Heischer. You replace Damon Severson and Ryan Graves with Brett Pesci and Brendan Dillon. So similar to what you said, Rachel, yeah, there's when you look at those players, are any of them like star players that stand out that are top of everyone's bucket list? No, they're they're, they're not the Predators. They didn't get Stamkos, March or so. They, they, that's not what they were aiming for. They were aiming for more depth. Yeah, Jay, it feels a little similar. I mean, there were some breakout stars, but not like superstars how are you looking at this team this year in that way yeah it, it's kind of similar to the devil situation i think the devils are a little bit further forward in this obviously guys like hughes he share etc are already kind of established at an nhl level but the blue jackets built the team this year with the knowledge that their young players were going to take a step forward you know we're talking about fantilli kent johnson um cole Selinger, Igor Chinikov, um there's, you know, there's room on the blue line now for David Juracek to make his kind of real debut and not, and, you know, get more than eight minutes of ice time a game, we hope. Uh, uh, I've got questions game, about that. Listen, listen. <laughs> I know, okay. Are they get, Are um, they going to use David Juracek properly this year? I, listen, if I, if I could make anything happen this season, it would be the David Juracek gets top minutes with Zach Wierenski because yeah. that's... That's what I want, and that's what he deserves. Anyway, um, but they they so they didn't bring in anyone really. Like I was I was looking at this question, I was thinking about it, and I was like, the closest like the closest thing to a breakout player that they have brought in, I would say, would probably be Sean Monahan, who you know obviously they brought Monahan in to play center with Gaudreau. That's not going to happen. But he had, I think, he had nearly sixty points last season between Montreal and, and Winnipeg. You know, he was very injured for a couple of seasons before that. People were starting to talk about, you know, is he washed? Is he done? Fully healthy Monaghan, I think, could be a real kind of breath of fresh air on this team. Um, he's a real grown-up adult center, which is something that the Blue Jackets haven't had maybe ever, um, you know, or, you know, at least since Brandon Dubinsky, for example. I think Monaghan is better than Dubinsky, but, like, that might be the last time they had a real adult center and not children and wingers playing at center. Yeah, I, I think it is going to be a very challenging year in Columbus. It's going to be a challenging year for all of our teams as we try to get into the top half of the division. 
We're going to talk about what's at stake for all of our teams and maybe get our digs in into the other teams that aren't here just for funsies coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And for NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Plus, it's not just the NFL you can bet on with FanDuel's easy-to-use app. Of course, as the NHL season draws near, you can place bets on point total over-unders like the ones we discussed here today, as well as awards picks, division winners, and which team is going to win the whole thing and bring home the Stanley Cup in June. That's FanDuel.com. To get $200 in bonus bets when you place a $5 bet, FanDuel, official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, so I hinted earlier in the show that there really isn't like a ton at stake for the Flyers in terms of moving up in the division. Uh, The last time the Flyers made the playoffs was uh, in the bubble where they won a round. The Devils have made the playoffs most recently of any of these teams. Are they the most hungry to get back into the playoff conversation? And if they don't, like, what are the consequences here? Well, that's a really tough question because we're we're anticipating for them to make the playoffs. That's the thing. If if they miss it, it really depends. Like if the players aren't responding well to Sheldon Keefe, then like it is in, in hockey, you're going to have to you might find a new voice. I don't really know. But that's like worst case scenario. And by the way, uh, Patrick, shout out to uh, Ryan Graves. I forgot. I completely forgot that Ryan Graves. Signed with the Pittsburgh Penguins, so hope do, hope, hope he's doing well. But, do you want uh, him back? Because uh, because no. I'm, I'm kind of tired of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me think about that. He was good with the Devils, and and I, I thought the contract was good for at the time. But uh, yeah, here it's not really going all that well in Pittsburgh. Respect. So, Rachel, I don't really know. Like if if, if they don't miss the playoffs, I, or if they do miss the playoffs, I'm gonna be puzzled. Jay, do you think? Columbus is kind of playing with house money this year on this front. Like, is there, is there an expectation? So is there a point of disappointment here? Oh, absolutely not. Like two weeks ago would have been a very different answer, you know? Um, But right now I think the goal is let's get through the season. And, you know, I think no one is going to be like, what do you, what do you do with this team? If they end up, this team could go, Oh, and 82 and I don't think anyone would be able to sit here and criticize anything about it you know um I don't think they'll be that bad but they really are kind of like you said playing with house money um if they finish if they end up drafting first overall great you know like it'll suck to sit through another miserable losing season but they really there really are no expectations here um and there really are no consequences either because you've got a, a Brand new head coach, brand new GM, like neither of those guys are getting fired regardless of what happens this season. So it is really just kind of like a, let's just see how it goes. Patrick, the Penguins made the playoffs for 16 consecutive seasons, but have not for the last two. Um, And they seem to be holding on to this core for give it one more go. Well, I guess Crosby is sticking around for a few more years, but um, like, what are, what are the consequences here if they don't make the playoffs? It's, it's really tough to say. I mean, obviously I think the, the most obvious answer is maybe they get a new head coach and move on from Mike Sullivan. But at the same time, you can tell that Kyle Dubas in Fenway sports group, the ownership are very committed to him and they think he's one of the best coaches around. And I would be inclined to agree because if you look at some of the recent failures, whether it's missing the playoffs or first round exits for the last few years, it's really difficult to pin it on coaching alone because the guys you need to perform have performed. Your core guys have continued to be productive members of the team it's been things like goaltending has fallen apart on them down the stretch or the former general manager that the Philadelphia Flyers cursed us with in Ron Hextall did not seem to have any sort of a plan outside of, 
hey, maybe Crosby, Malkin, and Latang can carry this team again, and we don't need anybody else. So I also uh, you think, noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and I also I, I've said this on our show. I think even though they're not saying it out loud, they're saying, hey, we're gonna compete again this year and all this stuff. I think they're looking at this upcoming season as a little bit of a wash because going into next year, especially now having Crosby locked down next summer, they're going to have a boatload of cap space available to them. They're going to have a few young guys who either have another year of development under their belt or are ready to come up to the NHL and they'll be able to take one last big swing, whether it's via trade or free agency. But I think if they miss this year, it may lead to some difficult conversations. But if it turns out to be a worst case scenario where this team completely falls on its face, then we might see some big changes going into the offseason. Sidney Crosby surprised me last season. The way he carried the team on his back towards the end of it. Um, because I thought the Penguins were down and out, but they made a run for it. And like the Devils, they didn't get it. But I said, if Sidney Crosby wills that team to the playoffs, yes, he will not be a finalist for the heart, but you got to put his name in discussion at least. A, a, a lot of surprises on the Penguins roster, especially given their age. Just to kind of, as someone who has been frustrated by the Penguins for the past decade and change, um, I love Mike Sullivan as a coach. Uh, yeah. I was really rooting for the Penguins to fire him this offseason so we could swoop in and have him. Um, because the problem with this is if you get rid of Mike Sullivan, then you don't have Mike Sullivan anymore. Jay, you sound kind of just same, like me. Kind of same thing. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing with do they get rid of Evgeny Malkin? Well, if you do that, then you. the problem with doing that is that you don't have Evgeny Malkin anymore. And so the Penguins are a really interesting case because I don't think that there's a ton that they can do right now to change the roster without making it worse. You know, yeah, they can they can add, they can tweak, but kind of like the Leafs, their money is locked up in kind of the, the big four. So the Penguins are going to be what they are. And I think if people are looking to the Penguins for being a drastically different team next season, I think they're going to be disappointed because I don't think you can, you can't improve this team without giving up pieces and the pieces that you give up will not make the team, like losing Eric Carlson. The team will be worse without Eric Carlson. So that's kind of my opinion on the Penguins is I would love for them to kind of do what the Washington Capitals have done and kind of crumbled into dust. But I don't think they're going to do that just yet, as much as it pains me to say. Yeah, um, I, I will also add that uh, there's a reason why Mike Sullivan is the head coach for Team USA heading into Four Nations and the Olympics coming around. He is that good of a coach. Um you know, speaking of some of those other teams, uh, I, I think it'll be really interesting if we have a similar playoff battle toward the end of the season in terms of what teams are in it. Uh, I, I'm really looking at, you know, the other teams here. And if the Islanders and Caps do not look like uh, they are teams. Years old, Rachel. Yeah, they, they cannot. Seven. <laughs> exactly. I, I just really think both of those teams are going to fall. And two of the four of us are going to be talking about the playoffs next year. But uh, what do y'all think about that? Well, that's kind of the fun of this, isn't it? Is uh, oh, for me anyway. And I know the Blue Jackets weren't in the conversation um, basically at all this season. Um, but for me, it's way more fun when you do have this kind of end of season, like, ooh, who's going to make it as opposed to, you know, well, it's December and the top three spots are locked up and there might be a battle for fourth place, you know, but right until I think like the very last game of the season for a bunch of teams, yeah. like the Flyers, the Red Wings, um, the Capitals, it were really kind of hinged on the last games of the season as to whether they were going to make it. And I think that's fun and exciting. Um, stressful for the teams involved, probably, but also uh, way more fun than, oh, well, the it's going to be the same four teams. It always is. So Yeah, I, and, and I, I don't see, like you said, Rachel, I look at the two teams that finished in third and fourth, the Islanders and the Capitals, and I look at their off-seasons, and I'm not going to say like the Penguins had a great off-season because I think it was fine enough, but I look at the way they, they got in, and I go, did these teams really improve upon what they did last year or are they kind of hitting the status quo 
And I think they did. And as much as I was shocked to see the LA Kings able to move on from PLD and send them to Washington, there's a reason this guy's on his third team. And if they can fourth, yeah, that's right. Fourth. Sorry. I forgot one, but like at the same time you look at it and go this, you might not be the ones to fix him. And this isn't a team that's looking for a lot of development. This is a team that needs to be good now. And I, then the Islanders are just the Islanders. They kind of did everything around the margins. I don't see a big game changer there. So I think you're right. Like I look at the, 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 the teams that just missed, I think the devils are going to be right in it for the top. I think the Flyers are going to hang around again because John Tortorella can get blood out of a stone. It's his one superpower. And then you got the Penguins who still have a lot of talent. So (laughs) so I I think that you're right. I think at least two of us from this episode are going to be talking about this team, our teams possibly making the postseason again. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you guys the average age for some of the teams in the Metro. Uh, the Penguins are number two uh, in the entire NHL for average age. Um, Hurricanes are seventh, Islanders are eighth, and the Capitals are tenth. Going back to what uh, you said, uh, Patrick, when it comes to the the Capitals, I've said it on my show religiously. At this point, Alexander Ovechkin is just gunning for the Wayne Gretzky all-time goal record, which is an, an incredible accomplishment. And he's going to get it. No ands, ifs, or it's not a matter if, it's a matter of when. But that's not going to win you championships. But here's the thing. The Capitals already won a championship a few years ago, 2018. Uh, so it's 2024. Wow, that was a while ago, actually. So um, I, Ovechkin has nothing else to accomplish. And we saw in the playoffs, he, he basically was non-existent. And Rachel, for the Flyers, I actually do respect John Tortorella. Yes, he could be tough. But I think the thing about Tortorella is that he genuinely does care about his players. We saw that with the Kevin Hayes situation where he he went to bat for him despite Kevin Hayes no longer being a part of the organization. And I, I just think that, um, you know, it, it's going I, I think it's going to be the Devils, Rangers, Hurricanes. And then that middle tier is kind of up for grabs, similar to what it was last year. It's just a matter of who's going to click at the right possible time because the Penguins, they clicked a little too late. The Flyers fizzled out hard towards the end, almost made the playoffs despite having one of the worst or if not the worst power play in the NHL. It was the worst. You don't have to look it up. And the Capitals just, um, uh, like I said, Ovechkin was a cone during the playoffs, a traffic cone. Did, did, didn't really do anything, but he doesn't need to. He's already accomplished pretty much everything you can accomplish. And uh, Jay, for the for the uh, Blue Jackets, I actually do have a soft spot in my heart for the Blue Jackets because they have a lot of University of Michigan Wolverine players on their roster. Um, and both my parents went there, so I, I do have a soft spot in my heart for the Blue Jackets a little bit. And also, and also Damon Severson. Um, but yeah, I think the Metro in terms of the middle tier is going to be up for grabs. Yeah, um, I I think with the Caps, they have drafted extremely well. I just think those draft picks aren't quite ready yet, and that's why this year isn't going to be the year for them. Uh, But the following year, I think everybody's going to have to watch out a little bit for the Caps. But we'll see how this season turns out. This has been a ton of fun talking to y'all. Hopefully, maybe all of us can make the playoffs in a perfect world, right? Thanks for making this episode of the 2024 Locked On NHL season preview your first listen today. For your second listen, catch the rest of the Metro Division and every episode of the 2024 Locked On NHL season preview on Locked On NHL on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. 